So welcome to CEO Talks again. So just to give you background context, we have these once a month, and these are all individuals that I've met personally that have personally inspired me that come and speak. And we have no budget for CEO Talks, but we've had some of the most amazing speakers um, come through. And so Shiv is one, just to give you some background context. Um, I think around a month plus ago, not very recently, I was invited to this very privileged dinner with Princess Amira, who is uh, married to the wealthiest man in Saudi Arabia, or like the Middle East. And she organized a dinner of what she called it's the uncommon table of people who want to make the world better. And 30 plus people there, including you know the presidents of almost every major foundation. Um, the most common word I think I heard used at the dinner was the word billion. So billions of people, billions of dollars, I mean, people doing big things. And yet, like as you get better at judging individuals, there's only two people in the room I want to spend more time with. And there was one I definitely want to spend more time with, and that was Shiv. And so in a matter of just weeks, I, I feel like I found someone at a soul level that's part of my family. And Shiv and I have spent, I mean, this is our third or fourth meeting already just in a couple of weeks, plenty of time together. And so there's something with Shiv that just really has inspired me even more, where Shiv will tell you more about his story and give you a chance to ask questions, but has made his life mission to find the next Gandhi, the next Nelson Mandela, and build this army of do-gooders that can change the world. And it's very similar to how we think and operate at Next Jump. And, and so, and, and Shiv just turned 50 um, two months ago. And, and so, and it's this notion that he's looking for these people, and as I thought about the last several weeks, there's a big insight I had personally, which is what Shiv is trying to do is what I call in our active learning iteration, Gandhi version two. Gandhi version two will be better than version one. Version one's one person. Version two is this notion of the Avengers. Alone we do good, but together we do great. And what I realized is this is part of Gandhi version two. Shiv is part of that army. And what we're doing is just getting together faster and faster with the different Gandhis and Mandelas to build version two of this army. And when Shiv said he was 50, right? I met some people who had said that, you know, I'm too old to make the tide change in the world. There was this interesting story my mom I always thought about. where So, so my mother is a pastor of a church, and she told me, um, she met this woman in Korea years ago that was 60 years old. And she talked about, God, if I was 10 years younger, if I was, when I was 50, the things I could do if I was 50, right? And had this huge list she went off on. It happened that we moved to Nigeria, lived there for, you know, 17 years, but approximately 10 years later, she went back to Korea. And she happened to bump into the exact same woman. So now she was 70. And she said, you know, like, God, the things I wish I could do if I was 10 years younger, at 60, the things she would do. And it was such an awesome insight my mom had, profound, to see the person was living in all the things they could do versus what they are doing. And Shiv is a guy who is doing it. So I am thrilled to introduce you to um, my good friend, Shiv. Thanks, Shiv. Good to see Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I echo what Charlie said. I was sitting next to Charlie at this big, illustrious dinner, and we got talking. I must admit my ignorance. I knew nothing about Next Jump. So when I got Charlie's card, I said, Next Jump, what does it do? And he told me a little bit about it, and it sounded interesting. And then the dinner went on, and then we started talking about other things. And as we started talking, we realized, actually, it wasn't about what Next Jump does that was attracting me to the conversation, but it was about the values that we share together. And it was something much broader, much deeper. And I immediately said, and Charlie said, look, I'd love you to come and visit my office. And although I had a very packed schedule and I was only in town for 48 hours, I said, look, I'm going to cancel other things and go and visit Next Jump and see what Charlie's talking about. And I want to congratulate all of you because you are some of the luckiest people I know. Working in an environment like this, in a company like this, with values like this, is really a blessing. And all of you, uh, I know, know that, which is why you're here. And what is our life about? You know, what, why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, you've all heard Simon Sinek speak it's about the why. At the end of the day, we should wake up in the morning and we should feel inspired to lead a life that's not just an ordinary life, but to lead an extraordinary life. And how do we do that and bring that extraordinary quality to our daily life? And I believe that it's all about spirituality. And that's a word that people like to throw out 
uh, poo-poo. It creates a lot of nervousness. People say, oh, spirituality, religion, all that stuff. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about religion. It doesn't matter if you're Hindu, Christian, Buddhist, Taoist, uh, you know, Jewish. That's, that, that's not the issue. The issue is, are you a deeply spiritual human being? And are you connected to your own spirituality? And I'll come to that in a little while. My own life journey. What have I done? How have I lived my life till now? I'm very lucky. I was born in India, in Delhi, uh, to a wonderful, loving family. My mother is Sikh from Punjab. and My father is Marwari from Rajasthan. They had a love marriage. They came from very different backgrounds. And uh, they, both of them had great trauma in their childhoods. My mother lost her father at a very young age. Uh, he was part of the freedom movement in India. He supported Mahatma Gandhi. He lost his life for that. And so she grew up in great poverty, having grown up in great wealth, and then lived a very interesting and spiritual life uh, and continues to do so. My father uh, came from a business family that in the mid-50s, the business was nationalized. They lost everything. They had to start again. And he's built up a big business uh, and been very successful at doing what he does. So I grew up in this home with a lot of love, a lot of attention, affection. But unfortunately, I had asthma. As a child, I was missing school. And I was missing four, five, six months of school a year. And my father and mother decided that that was not sustainable and I should go abroad for medical treatment. So when I was 12, I was 11 years old. And my brother was eight. He also had asthma. Both of us went to France, where my uncle lived. And we went to a boarding school in France where we got medical treatment. We got better, but my father and mother decided that we should go to England because it was across the channel and we'd speak English later in life with an English accent. And so we got shipped across and we ended up at boarding schools in England. And I ended up at a very stiff British boarding school called Eton. Now, some of you may have heard of Eton, but it's a school that started 550 years ago and 23 prime ministers of England went to Eton and it was a very privileged school and very British school. And many of the people that had uh, led India during the Raj, many of the people that my grandfather had been fighting to get out of our country had all been educated there for many, many generations. So there was a lot of racism at that school. When I came, there was a lot of racism that there was an Indian at the school. I was one of the only Indians in my year at school and so on. And it was really a challenge for me to become comfortable and confident with my own internal spirituality while being in an environment that was very hostile to me in many ways. And so that early experience, the guides I had were my daily prayers, my daily practice of meditation, my own guides in my life, my parents, and most importantly, Mahatma Gandhi. So Mahatma Gandhi is someone whose biography, I was autobiography I was given when I was, uh, I think, 12, 13 years old by my mother and father, and I started reading it. And when I read about the way in which Gandhi had dealt with adversity, not by becoming bitter and hateful, but by becoming deeper spiritually, more forgiving, more loving, uh, made a huge impact on me. And I decided that I would try in my own small way to follow that path in my daily life. I was at Eton for five years. After my first year, I made many friends, had a wonderful time, enjoyed the school, and uh, realized that people are people everywhere but it's about how people are exposed. So I'll give you a small story to illustrate what I mean by that. The people in their homes, in their families, in their societies are brought up with prejudices, with minds that are often closed. So when I was 17 years old at Eton, we had a system at Eton called fagging. And I know in the US, the, different, the words, word has different meanings, but uh, I was the fag master and I had a fag who was this little boy uh, at Eton who would come and uh, each senior boy had a junior boy who would come and polish his shoes, hang up his clothes and at the, uh, when you joined Eton at 13 you would work for a senior boy so that you would have humility, you would understand service and you would have a mentor hopefully in a senior year who would teach you about various things. So this was a system that had gone on for four or five hundred years and I was a fag to a fag master and then when I became the fag master. There was a junior boy who was assigned to me. And this junior boy came from a very aristocratic British family. 
They had been, they had come and they had ruled India for four generations, his ancestors. They had been the number two man to the Viceroy of India. They had been generals. They had a lot of things that they had won, won many uh, accolades for their campaigns in India and so on. And so this little boy of 13 had all this history and baggage that he brought with great pride to Eton. He had his grandfather's top hat. He had the tailcoats from his uh, ancestors. And then suddenly he had to work and clean the shoes of an Indian boy. He felt this was very unjust. But this is how the school worked, and he was you know, assigned to me. And I could see his discomfort. And so I said to him, look, you know, I could, without him saying anything, I could sense his discomfort. So I said, look, you don't have to do, you don't have to clean my shoes. I clean my shoes anyway on my own. But could you, would you mind hanging up my clothes? Would you mind going down the street to buy me some, uh, you know, do some errands? Because we had to make these young people do something for us. And over the year, we became good friends. At the end of the year, he took me aside and he said, Shiv, I need to talk to you. It's very important. And I was leaving the school the next day. And so I made half an hour of time. I went and sat down with him in his room. And he said, Shiv, I have to confess something. We'd been known each other for now almost a year. He said, Shiv, I have to confess that when I came to Eton, I used to hate Indians and Pakistanis. He said, I used to hate Indians and Pakis as they called as he as he, as he called them and he said but now i only hate packies <laughs> so i said nicholas i said nicholas i'm honored that 900 million of my fellow fellow countrymen have been relieved of your hatred uh, but have you met any packies he said no i haven't but i still hate them so so we grow up with prejudices because we grow up in silos uh, and so I think I learned many things there. I then had the fortune of coming to Brown University. I did my undergraduate degree at Brown. I did a, a, a studied English and economics. Then my father sent me, we were a family business. He sent me to Latin America. I lived in Venezuela uh, and Brazil. I learned Spanish, I learned Portuguese, spent a year and a half in each country and built up a significant business in that part of the world for our family. I then went back to Wharton, did my MBA did a master's in international studies and a master's in Portuguese in the Lauder program at Wharton. Uh, I'm on the board of Wharton now, and I'm on the President's Council at Brown, and I'm very involved with these schools because I believe they're great institutions and that they have a lot to teach us and to teach the world. When I was 28 years old, I was all set to go back to Rio and work in Brazil because we had an office there and wanted to do more work there for our family business. And my father said, I want you to go to Moscow. So in 1990, I was 28 years old, my father sent me off to Moscow, and I lived in Russia for the next 21 years. In Russia, we built up uh, Russia's second largest beer company, beer, soft drinks. We were bottling Coke, bottling Pepsi, mineral water, and beer. We built up a chocolate business. Uh, the beer company grew to be a $4 billion company, which we sold to Interbrew. We built up uh, one of Russia's large chocolate companies, which we sold to Nestle. And we built up a number of other businesses during that time. Um, for me, it was a very interesting experience because not only did I learn Russian and get to know another culture, but I learned the power of building a team that is able to work together and create together and contribute together, grow together and contribute together. Those two elements. And if you can do that and create a shared se sense of values, you can achieve great things in very difficult places. So Russia in the 90s, for anyone who doesn't know what happened in Russia in the 90s, I recommend you read a book called Sale of the Century, written by Christia Freeland. It's a book that tells you about what happened in the early 90s in Russia. As many of you know, I'm sure, uh, Gorbachev in 91 in October, the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia was created, Yeltsin took over. In 93, you have the White House being attacked by tanks, fire. You had the mafia. You had the privatizations. 180,000 enterprises were sold within 18 months. You had hyperinflation, 80% uh, a month. You had uh, the currency devaluation, thousands of percent of currency devaluation. You had a barter system where things were being bartered all the time. And at that time, we decided to build up a beer company. So we visited our first brewery. Uh, we visited 140 breweries in 91 and 92. We visited 
uh, throughout that region, uh, you know, 140 breweries, and we bought five breweries in 92 and 93, and we grew the company from a $30 million business with 10 million of losses to a business we sold for $4 billion 12 years later. 20% of the Russian beer market, a company the size of Coors or Labatt's or Guinness, all companies you would know. And we did that because we had a great team. Uh, and I was very privileged and fortunate to have a team that actually was committed to the task at hand. We lost two of our breweries to the mafia. We had all kinds of threats, all kinds of problems, all kinds of difficulties during that time. But what kept us together was we were a band of brothers. We were a team that believed in what we were trying to do. And we believed that by doing it in our own way, without Russian partners, in an ethical way, in a proper way, we could succeed. And we didn't want the bad guys to win. And we were fortunate. We were lucky. We avoided many problems at that time. We were able to build something very attractive. But all through this time, for me, the question was why? Why are we creating more businesses and more wealth? And for us, we've had a family foundation that's been very active uh, and done many things for many years. Uh, and we've been active in healthcare, in education, and in, in the environment. Those are the three areas that our family foundation has been active in. And for me, it was all about creating wealth so we could give to the family foundation to actually do things that we believed were impactful and positive uh, in our country, in our environments, and in the world. So that was very important uh, all through my, my work. Um, the other thing that many of you would know, those of you who are from India would definitely know, perhaps some of the others of you would know as well, is that in India, in our ancient culture, 3,000, 4,000 year old culture, the ideal life is broken into four stages of life. The first stage of life is the stage of being a student, the first 25 years. The second stage of life is broken into your career and your family. So building your family and building your career. I turned 50 uh, two months ago, and the third phase of life is about working on one's own spirituality and service. Being a teacher, serving, working in the community, and giving back. Because it's very easy to take the third phase of your life and continue to do what you did in the second phase of your life. And suddenly your life runs out. You, if you continue to make more money and build more companies and so on, you can keep doing that. But what's the point? Why is there this de desire to keep building the business till it's bigger and bigger and bigger? Didn't make any sense to me. Didn't make any sense to my brother. So we said, look, when we reach a certain stage in our lives, we want to devote a significant part of our life energy to the service and spirituality side dimension of what we do. And so given that, uh, we had built our businesses and we felt, let us now make the foundation work much more engaged, active, and real. Let's make the foundation work something that is not just about giving money, but it's about giving our life energy, our time, our intellect, our spiritual energy, and let's try and figure out what we want to do. So as I thought about this, um, and I've been thinking about this all my life, when I was at Brown University, I did a course called Philosophy of Education. And in that course, I realized that the Western model of education, which has now dominated the planet, is like a plane flying with one engine. Now, it's good to have one engine, and that engine is about the rational mind, about the scientific revolution, about externalities, about creating things. But there's very little focus on the internal development in a scientific way of one's own spiritual strengths. And if one looks back to the ancient traditions of Asia, whether it was China or India, there were these, the old systems of education actually focused on one's spiritual development. And that was the second engine that was missing. And I felt that there needed to be a way to bring that back and to actually meld the West and the East in terms of the external world and the internal world so that you have an integrated world and your, the, the human energy, the life energy that we have is actually productive to its maximum extent. Because otherwise, often there's a dichot dichotomy about external creation, which is often value-less, which leads to many problems on the planet, and the internal world, which often becomes dry and loses its spiritual strength. But when you can integrate those two things, as I see you're doing in this company, and I see that with Charlie, 
you can create great things. And so for me, I said, what do, what do I want to do with my life? And what do I see as the world's problems? And how can I address my life energy to those world problems? And in everything I've done in my life, uh, it's been about great mentors teaching me things. And it's been about great leaders who have led and created great things. Whether it was Gandhi, whether it was Mandela, whether it was Martin Luther King, all these were great leaders who had an impact way beyond their own little lives that actually changed things for the better. And the question I asked myself was, when we look at the world's problems today, we've grown from one billion people to seven billion people. We have huge shortage of water, resources coming up on the planet, energy, uh, you know, the environment, uh, food security, conflict on the planet, you know, on and on. When one looks at the fishbowl called the world today, with all the modern technologies of the media, the internet, television, it's in our face every day. The huge problems that we face. And who is really leading? Where are the leaders to actually lead our planet from a place of pain to a place of joy, happiness, and strength? Where are those leaders? And I felt there was a real lack of great leadership on the planet. So-called leaders that are leading our planet are people that honestly often lack spiritual depth. They're self-serving, often self-centered. They may be very talented. They may have a lot of technical competence, but I don't see a lot of spiritual depth. And so I said, well, I keep complaining about this. What am I going to do about it? What am I as a human being going to do to make a difference about this? Where, where are these leaders? And so instead of complaining about it, I said, let me start looking for these leaders. Let us start looking for leaders making an assumption that they exist. Let's make an assumption that Gandhi exists age 13 and Mandela exists age 15. Where are these leaders? If we could find them and if we could guide them, train them and give them a platform to allow them to express their human and spiritual energy to the best of their capacity, that would be a wonderful thing to do. And that would be a meaningful life work. Even if we found at the end of all of that one leader, that would have been a meaningful life. And so we started with that idea, and the question was, how does one find these leaders? So we took one school in Delhi, uh, and we worked with the principal. We started talking to the teachers about this idea, and we said, look, let's find this child that demonstrates exceptional leadership potential and talent. Then the question became, how do you define leadership potential and talent? Because leadership is not just about success. Leadership is too often defined about success monetarily defined or in terms of power. It's not often defined in terms of altruism, in terms of many other things. And so for me, uh, we started with the definition of leadership. And what we realized was what separated, you know, Hitler was a leader, Stalin was a leader, Gandhi was a leader, Mandela was a leader. What separated these people? And what separated them in our eyes was a couple of things. All, all of them had leadership energy and leadership talent. So that was a fundamental pillar of what we were looking for. Many of them had, and all of them had a bias for action. They were people that were active, not just sitting around, they were doing things. They were engaged, they had followers. But then what separated them was ethics and integrity. So you found deep ethics and integrity in Gandhi, Mandela, Martin Luther King, and people like that, Aung San Suu Kyi. So ethics and integrity, could we identify that at schools at a young age? The child that doesn't cheat in their exams, the child that goes to the teacher and says, ma'am, you've given me seven marks when I should have got five marks in my paper. There are children like that. Could we find children that were deeply ethical and full of integrity at a young age? And finally, altruism. Because you could be ethical, full of integrity, but self-serving. So we needed people that were altruistic, people that cared about others and about society around them more than about just themselves. So these were the four pillars. Leadership, a bias for action, <coughs> ethics and integrity, and finally, altruism. So we told the teachers, we're looking for this. How do we find this? So we created a curriculum. We put it in one school. And the curriculum is rather like flypaper. We put the flypaper in, and the purpose was to attract children that exhibited these four qualities. 
for class 8, 9, and 10, when they're 13, 14, 15, we exposed all the children in school to this. Uh, we grew from one school. We're now at 75 schools. We now have 65,000 children in our program. So we screen, we train 65,000 children. In the last six years, we've grown it to 65,000 children. We screen 65,000 children over three years to look for these four qualities. Then we identify about 10% of these 65,000 children, and we take those children because we think they exhibit these four qualities in different dimensions. And then we work with those, that 10% for the next two years in a very deep and detailed way with the teachers, giving them projects to go and work in a village to test, because it's very easy to talk about leadership. But when you see it in the field, you see if the child really has the capacity to lead or real altruism when they've been working 24 hours and they've had no food, are they able to still have a, uh, an attitude that is conducive towards altruism and ethics in that environment? So we sort of test these children. And then at the end of that period, we select. We have an interview process and they have to write essays, they have to come and speak to us and so on. We select the best of those children and then we try and give them a platform to be able to grow and contribute. That is what our foundation does. So of 65,000 children, we've now chosen 60 children. Those 60 children are now at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton. We send them to the best colleges in the world. We give them full scholarships, whatever they need. And then we start to become their mentors. And we need people to mentor them. So Charlie has very kindly agreed to become a mentor and to help guide these children as they go into their, uh, their lives. We love them to come and work, spend the summer working with all of you here, for example, some of them, so that they would understand what great companies and what great values are all about. In the last six years, I've probably spent 5% of my time on this work. In the last two months or three months, I've decided to spend 50% of my time on this work. So as I am now spending a lot of my energy on this work, we now want to scale it up the way we would scale up a business. Because at the end of the day, to be in one country and to work with 75 schools is not what the objective is. From day one, we named our foundation the Global Education and Leadership Foundation. We're now in five countries. We're in Gabon in West Africa. We're in Burma in Myanmar. We're in the UAE. We're in Bhutan. And we're in India. Why? Because the leaders of those countries are people we knew, friends of ours, and they said, please start. Please start in our country. We want you to identify, work with schools, and identify these children. Once we've selected these children, we have a conference every year in India for these children. And we invite, so this year we had a conference in August. We had 60 children, uh, and we had 200 mentors. Business people, political leaders, academics, uh, you name it, people coming to give their time and energy to work with these children, to give them a chance to really succeed, and to understand the realities of leadership uh, on the planet. And we're very, we, we make a big emphasis that it's not these children, we don't want them to feel entitled. They are not leaders. We don't want them to think, oh, I've been selected as a leader, so I'm a leader. We make sure we emphasize to them that we're giving them a platform, but they're real. Uh, mission and vision, if they're the right person, is going to be to be a servant leader, to serve. That is really the mission of this group of people. And what's interesting is, as we have this group, we find more and more adults and more and more people at work and so on coming to help us in this work, in this mission. Uh, we're going to start our first conference in the US next year, because I think the US embodies a lot of the values that I believe in. I think. You're very fortunate, many of you, all of you, to work here, and many of you to have grown up here and to have studied here, because the US uh, brings together a lot of the values that we believe in, values about uh, equality of human beings, gender equality, about education, about meritocracy, about the chance to create and the chance to benefit from that creation, the chance to help uh, a global vision so we think, you know, a melting pot. All these things are concepts that we very much believe in. And we don't want our, these young adults that are coming through our program to 
uh, look at their country as their primary objective and goal, because we think it's very narrow-minded. We want these children to be globalists. I was fortunate. My life led me to be a globalist. I lived all over the world. I speak seven languages, feel comfortable all over the world by, by, by luck. But we want these young people to look at the world as their home, look at the world's problems as their home. And then, of course, their country is important. Of course, it's important to be a patriot. But it's more important to be a humanist. It's more important to realize that we are all human beings living on in one village called the planet. And the more we think about the zero-sum game, us versus them, the more we will be headed towards disaster over the next 50 years on our planet. But the more we share, the more we build uh, a sense of human community on the planet, the more we will be able to solve the problems of the planet. So that's briefly what we're doing. That's briefly the story. Uh, I'd love to talk with all of you and have a dialogue rather than a monologue. And uh, so, so what we do is we, we have these index cards so people throw questions through the process. And so okay. I'll start with different offices, starting with London, We'll go to San Francisco, Boston, and then back to New York. So um, I guess on the phone in London, I don't know who has the question, but um, whoever is moderating London, can you, one of you ask a question, I guess, from who? So, hi, Shiv, a great talk. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, it was really, uh, really a pleasure to hear you. Uh, I guess the first question came from um, someone behind me here. Uh, when did you first realize that this was going to be your mission? I know you kind of, it's kind of formulated over over time, but you know, a lot of we have a lot of younger people at Next Jump, and you know, I'd be I'd be curious to hear, you know, uh, you know, when 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 did it dawn on that, that this this particular uh, sort of um, endeavor was going to be your kind of life mission after age fifty? Uh, I think that the importance of leadership on the planet and often the lack of quality leadership on the planet is something that's grown in me over the last 25 years of my work experience. Uh, I understood theoretically that it was very important, but as I saw it in action, it became more and more real to me. As I met leaders of countries, as I interacted with them, as I saw the ones that I admired and respected, as I saw those that I didn't admire and respect, it grew on me. And I realized the critical importance of quality leadership, and that leadership being pruned and nurtured from a young age. So I would say in the last five years or six years, or maybe seven years, this idea has grown and grown and grown. Uh, and that's why we started the foundation in, uh, about six years ago. Okay. San Francisco? Uh, hi, I guess uh, one question is more regarding the whole idea of cultivating leadership for people who um, have leadership qualities and giving them a platform. Um, what happens with, uh, I guess, other people in terms of that don't necessarily display leadership? That's qualities? a very good question. It's a very good question, and I want to address that. I should have addressed that earlier. Um, it's not. We're not saying we believe everyone has the potential to improve their leadership skills and qualities. First thing, right? So it's not that we're saying, okay, they're the leaders, and then everyone else is kind of you know, knocked out of the equation. Which is why in class eight, nine, and 10, we have a three-year course curriculum on improving your leadership skills at schools. So that fly paper is a curriculum about improving your leadership skills and focusing on building your leadership capacity through your life. Um, we believe that, you know, everyone has the capacity to improve their leadership skills, and everyone needs to take on the responsibility of leadership within their communities and within their own environments. However, we believe that there's some young people that demonstrate exceptional leadership capacity, just like some people exhibit exceptional ability on the sports field or as musicians. So we're looking for those, that talent, and we're looking to give them a platform. Everyone else, what is very interesting is, as we expose um, these uh, children in schools to our program, what we're finding is, at the schools that we're active, the student body is choosing better leaders. So we're actually strengthening the, demo the, the democratic process. Because, for example, we work in a school in Chennai called Padma Sheshadri, which is one of the best schools in Chennai. 
the principal is a very committed lady, Mrs. YGP. She wrote a letter to me. She said, Dear Mr. Kemker, I want to tell you that in the last six years since your program started at our school, the leaders that the children are choosing to lead them in high school, at the president of the school, the class leaders, and so on, have improved in quality significantly. And our children are choosing much better uh, leaders to lead them. And that's a very important role, to choose to work with leaders. All of you are here because you believe in the leadership of this company, right? You believe in the values that this company espouses, which will enhance your own leadership skills, your own leadership capacity, and so on. So that is what we do. So we, our objective is to expose everyone to the curriculum on leadership, but not everyone has the talent or the desire or the interest to become a great leader as defined by what we say. Because great leadership in what we're saying has huge sacrifice attached to it. Gandhi, Mandela, Martin Luther King, you know, have had very, very difficult lives. Aung San Suu Kyi. These are not people that have had wonderful, happy you know, sort of lives enjoying the beach in Big Sur in California. These are people that have had a very difficult life. So not everyone is drawn to that mission in life. Question from Boston. <coughs> Thank you, Shiv. The, uh, one question here that I, I picked out. Um, of the children that you were mentoring, and if you, you mentioned it's, it's been now six years, kind of giving a platform to succeed. Could you share a specific story of a specific student, maybe a little bit of the context of, of their background along with um, maybe, you know, sharing some examples of, I know it's getting started, but how they've made a significant impact in giving back, uh, you know, to date? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously, you know, we expect and we believe that young people that demonstrate these qualities we're demonstrating these qualities before we came along and will demonstrate these qualities whether we're there or not, right? Giving back, altruism, ethics, leadership. You know, it's like the president of Harvard said, you know, we actually are a selection engine. We just select the best kids. They're already very smart. And they go out here and they enhance our reputation because the key is in the selection. So in a way, that's what we're doing as well. But uh, I'll give you some examples. So the first Kemka scholar who's just graduated from Yale, uh, uh, comes from a uh, modest family in Delhi. Her parents couldn't afford to send her abroad for education. Uh, she did extremely well at school. We identified her as someone with great talent, and we mentored her. And she got into Yale, and we gave her a full scholarship to come and study at Yale. She studied environmental engineering at Yale because she's passionate about the environment. She wants to change things in the environment. She then, uh, the, the, the vice chancellor of Yale, uh, liked her so much that she said, please come and join me for one year and work with me as my executive assistant for a year on a fellowship. So she's done that for the last few months. And then she wants to go to Stanford or to some other engineering school to do her master's in environmental studies. Now, What's interesting is, as we've watched her grow from a high school student into the person she is today, we've seen her flower and blossom. And um, she is someone that is deeply concerned about the world's issues, uh, deeply knowledgeable about the environment, um, is someone that has given back in India. You know, the rivers in India are very polluted. And so she has organized schools in India to come together and created a program at schools in India to work with young children on going back and helping lobby the government on cleaning the rivers. And being involved herself in making little projects to educate these children to go and help clean the rivers. So that's the type of activity that all these children are doing. Another child comes from a, um, in terms of the schools, this is an important comment that I missed out. We believe leadership exists everywhere. Leadership exists at the elite schools, it exists at an orphanage. It exists at a government school in a village. Leadership exists everywhere. So we have tried to, as we've built the program, to create a program that actually reaches across different categories of schools. Our program is still a pilot program. It's a very small program. So we have uh, children that come from the elite schools, as well as children who come from some orphanages and some schools where 
uh, people have come from very underprivileged backgrounds. And as we identify, we are seeing leadership everywhere. We are seeing this quality of leadership everywhere. And I'll give you some other examples. So, for example, uh, from the orphanages, we have found some children who have become, become part of our program. Now, their English language skills and so on have not been good enough to get them into the Ivy League schools. They just, the gap was too big. But by mentoring them and working with them, they have managed to get into some of our best Indian schools. So they are at schools called IIT. Maybe some of you are from IITs. Uh, and, you know, those are very, very, very good schools and very difficult schools to get into. And these children will have a totally different life uh, as they embark upon this life journey. There's a girl from Kashmir who comes from an uh, environment that is a conflict-ridden environment. Uh, she has grown up in the midst of a lot of uh, gender bias. And she is someone that, again, is outstanding. And she has come through the system. She is at one of the top universities in India. She would like to do her master's degree in the US later on. We will support her. So it's still early days, but the children that have come through the program so far are incredible. And uh, each one of them, uh, will all of them be uh, Gandhis? No. But will all of them make a difference in some way? I believe they will. I believe they will give back in some real way, in some meaningful way. As they interact with each other, there's a cohort effect of each of them working with each other to create a mission. So we have, uh, they have chosen four areas of work. Poverty and inequity, demographics, corruption and governance, and the environment. And they have chosen projects in these areas that they've adopted as their pet projects. And they work as a team on solving these projects during their summer holidays, during their working time while they're at university, uh, collecting thoughts, working as a team, collaborating, working with experts in the field. And so it's very interesting to see how they're giving back. And we want them to grow up with the sense of obligation, responsibility, as well as uh, growth and uh, success and achievement. But it's very important that they feel that they can, they are empowered to give back and to actually do something. Sure. Can you tell them the story about the, that one perfect grade student from Stanford, the question you asked yeah. them? I thought that was sort of phenomenal. Okay. So there was a, there's a student this year, actually, that we, you know, as our process, as our program gets better known, we're getting more and more applications and more and more incredible young people. So there was this uh, young boy from one of the big best schools in Delhi who's grades and extracurricular record over the last seven years or ten years is something that if I were to read to you all of us would say look this can't be true because not only has he got straight A's in every subject from English to mathematics he has been he is a musician he's a great sportsman he's done extracurricular activities and in his free time he has appeared in the world math olympiad and come 20th and, you know, it's one of these things you go, you know, and he's a good son at home. And so we're not quite sure how he does it because 24 hours in the day, we're not sure how he manages. And he became president of the school and president of games and everything. So one of these incredible young people. And uh, he wants to be in technology. He's a, he's a scientific. He wants to be an engineer and technology person. And um, so we interviewed him. We, we always, when these children come to us, because there's a scholarship attached we're a little skeptical. You know, we say, look, what is really driving them? Why, where are they arising from in terms of their desire to do these things? Because anyone can say, I want to be altruistic, I want to do all these things, but where is the real desire arising from? What is the real why in that person's life? And so this boy came into the interview. He had got into seven Ivy League schools. He would got full scholarships from five of them. And he turned them all down before he came to the interview. So I said, I said, look, that's not very smart. <laughs> I said, you've come to the interview. You're asking us for a scholarship to the one school you didn't get a scholarship to, which is Stanford. And you turned down Harvard, Yale, Princeton. I mean, you turned down full scholarships from all these schools. What's the deal? And he said, no, I want to go to Stanford. And I know that I'm confident that you know, with God's blessings, you will give me the scholarship to go to Stanford. I was like, okay, this guy, <laughs> you know, he's really pushing the frontier of his own self-confidence. So I was like, well, we don't know. It's very difficult. There are lots of good 
children and so on. You know, I wanted to test his, his, the decision that he took to turn down these five scholarships because there was a date by which he had to turn it down. And our interview was kind of after that date. And he came to us and said, no, I, I've turned all that down because I want to go to Stanford. And, I, and So I said, what if you don't get a scholarship from us? He said, no, I'll, God will find me a way. I will find a way to get to Stanford. All my life, I have found a way, and God will find my way. So I'm not worried about it. If you feel I'm worthy of a scholarship, please give it to me. If not, that's fine. So I was very impressed with the sort of deep spiritual rootedness of this child. Then I said to him, I said, look, Stanford is great. You know, I spent a summer there. My brother was there briefly. I said, you know, it's a fantastic place with your skills. You know, go start a company, you know, and then you can create, you know, a $100 million company, a $1 billion company. California is fantastic. You know, buy your Ferrari, buy a beautiful house on the beach. And then, you know, please give back something to India. You know, give back a check of a few million dollars a year from your billion dollar fortune when you're like the next Mark Zuckerberg or whatever. And he said, no, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I want to do. So I said, well, what do you want to do? I said, but that's the logical thing. Stanford, technology, entrepreneurship, venture capital, you know, that's logical. He said, no, look, I, I, I want to create value. I want to create businesses and so on. But that's, he said, what I really want to do is, for the last few years, I have realized that there is a confluence of technology and education which will allow technology and education to come together to educate the masses. All the poor people that don't have access to the best teachers on the planet and the best learning on the planet. And that's my destiny in life. I am going to work to make sure that technology and learning online and whatever the other methodologies are come together and we can actually democratize education at the lowest level across the world across the planet. To have that vision at such a young age, as a young person, was very meaningful to us. And then I tested him. I said, what do you know about it? And he knew a lot about it. He knew about the technologies that were there. He knew about Course Era and all these other programs that are coming online, online education and the problems, the challenges, the tablets, the cost of the tablet and all kinds of stuff. So of course he got the scholarship and he started at Stanford and he's already getting involved. He's get, We've introduced him to Salman Khan, you know, Khan Academy, which is something you all probably know about, uh, many other innovators in the area of technology and education. And we believe he's going to make a huge difference on the planet because that's what he wants to do. That's his life's desire. And it's rooted in something that's much beyond him. His why is very clear, why he wants to do what he wants. And then the how and the what will follow. Any questions in New York? I think you've, I think you've, I think, yeah, I think you've hit a very important question. You have to and repeat the question, I think. Yeah, so to repeat the question, it's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but what is spirituality? Is spirituality about God as defined in some religious way? Or is it about being honest with oneself and, uh, you know, those types of qualities which will create great leadership? The whole topic of spirituality, you know, we could spend a few hours on it, and I'm happy to come in and spend another uh, chat with all of you about that. But at the end of the day, when we, you know, all the world's religions, in my opinion, and all the spiritual traditions, everything can be condensed into four words, four words. Some a great Indian saint said that, Ramakrishna, and I think it's true. And it says, he said that the four words are be good, and do good, right? So, so if one takes that 
as the fun foundation of what spirituality is. Be good. So what does be good mean? Be good, we talk about integrity, honesty. We talk about compassion. We talk about team spirit. All of those things are defined as good. Uh, you know, hatred, envy, lust, lots of other things we can define as not so good. So the question is, each of us, I believe, the question one should ask oneself is, are we human beings with some kind of a spiritual life around us? Or we are, are we spiritual beings with a human life around us? So I'm a great believer that we are actually spiritual beings that lead a human life, that have a human dimension to our lives. And if that's true, then living up to that spiritual strength inside ourselves is what I define spirituality as. Now, what does that mean? Each religious tradition has guidance on spirituality. Whether you're a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Christian, uh, you know, from any other tradition, a Muslim, you will have constructs that come into your life, whether you're an atheist, whatever the construct is, there's a construct that brings a lot of rigidity into the spiritual process. A lot of form, a lot of um, um, historical baggage is what I call it. You can eat a cow, you can't eat a cow. You can eat a pig, you can't eat a pig. You have to ring the temple bell. You should pray every Sunday, you should pray five times a day. All of these things are pointers. Different religious traditions have mixed them up with rituals and they're making lots of pointers in different directions. I believe that the wellspring of spirituality lies within yourself. The true guru, as they say, lies within yourself. But all these pointers can be helpful if you approach them with an open mind, if you learn and listen, accept what you like, reject what you don't like, approach it with an open mind. But if you do, I think the real answers to one's own spirituality lie within oneself. And the ancient traditions of, the, of Asia, India and so on, about meditation, about going inside oneself, how does one go inside oneself beyond the layer of the mind, the intellect? What is the layer below that? These are questions that are very old, ancient questions. And there are some classic texts that, uh, from all traditions, by the way, where you have people that have experimented in the laboratory of their self-life and gone deep to find the answers to these questions. Now, I have been meditating since I was a little boy. I started when I was maybe five, ten years old. I'd meditate maybe five minutes a day. I'd pray five minutes a day. In the last few years, it went up to maybe one hour a day. Now I'm increasing it to two hours a day. So as I go deeper, I took a 10-day retreat, 10-day silent meditation retreat called Vipassana, where you sit for 10 days in silence and you watch. And I always explain it like our lives are rather like a glass of a jug of water with so much sand at the bottom. And we lead our lives by shaking this all the time because we have inputs all the time coming into us through our senses. All the time we're getting sensory input. We're reading things, we're talking to people, we're doing things. The sensory input that's always coming in shakes this glass of water all the time, this jug. And there's no clarity. As the mind energy works constantly with this, the sand rises up and you can't see anything. But when you put it down and you allow the mind to still, and the sand settles, you can see through that clear water and one's life perception becomes much clearer. And one starts to approach what is deeply spiritual within oneself. So that's the spiritual spirituality I'm talking about. Another way to describe it is that think of our minds like a fire that is consuming data, information. Logs of wood are being thrown onto the flames all the time. And as these flames burn this wood, this data, these impressions, these thoughts, these relationships, these interactions, we keep being engaged. The fire keeps burning. When we stop throwing logs of wood onto that fire 
And this 10-day meditation does that because there's no input. You're not allowed to talk to anyone. You shut yourself off from the world for 10 days. And in every spiritual tradition, there was the tradition of silence and monks and living in silence. Why? For a reason. This fire starts to get extinguished because you're not putting any more logs onto the fire. There's no more new data coming on. And what happens is the fire turns inward and it starts to consume the logs that are stored in the attic of your mind. And it starts to burn through all the old material. And as it does that, you actually clear your whole mind space. And you become, the fire eventually, once it's burnt, the current inputs and the historical inputs comes to a place of rest. And that place of rest is similar to the jug of water being left for 10 days and the sand has all settled. And there's clarity. And one can start to understand oneself better. And in every tradition, getting to know oneself was the highest uh, goal of life. And with this group of 60 young people that we get together, we spend a lot of time exposing them to meditation and the spiritual traditions of the world. They must learn about all spiritual traditions. We don't want narrow-minded, close-minded young people. But we don't want them to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, we don't want to know anything about all of this because frankly, we, we come from a place of mind and intellect and not from a place of spirit. So we want them to be comfortable with the place of the spirit. It's very important. Shiva, I, I want to thank you. It was literally just awesome and amazing. Um, so one of the things we'll do is we, we send out a survey afterwards and we'll gather questions. If the team does it as well as we hope, within 24 hours we'll have further questions and stuff, which I'll send you a copy of, comments Please. from the talk, which I think is always great for a speaker. And we keep it nice and hot so that we can test if they're awake and <laughs> lose weight. So, great. so I'm, I'm joking about the heat, but, um, but, but thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you.